cool. Thank you very much, uh, especially for that amazing, amazing introduction. Um, so to kill a working dream, Apologize, everybody. I think I just by accident took Lucky off stage. Um, beginner mistake. Please bear with me. <laughs> Lucky, here you are again. I sincerely apologize, and now I take myself off, and hopefully not you again. <laughs> Let me just make sure I share my screen. Okay. There we are. Hi again, everyone. Um, at this point. You've heard my name quite a few times, <clears throat> but allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ntlanta Lakingosi, and I do quite a few things. So I'm from a wonderful, wonderful city called Johannesburg, right here in South Africa. And here in Joburg, I work for a software development company called BBD. At BBD, I work in a unique team known as ATC, where we are charged with BBD's research and development responsibilities. We do some specialized consulting, but I think the most rewarding thing about uh, my job is that we're also in charge of facilitating learning for PBD's 800 plus employees that are spread across the world. I also teach. Um, I am a co-lecturer at Vitz's Digital Arts Department. And in the little extra time that I do have, I do some work under the social Cohesion Advocates Program in the Department of Arts and Culture, and I sit on the board of the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation. I've said a lot, but the most important thing that you should all know about me at this point is that my Twitter handle is at nlaki underscore Nkosi. Please feel free to let me know what you think of this talk. I'd really, really, really like to get some feedback um, from you. So starting with this morning's keynote, I can guarantee that a lot of the talks that you'll hear on this conference will be very wholesome talks. They'll teach you stuff, you'll walk away inspired. This talk is gonna be slightly different. That's because in this talk, I'll mostly be telling you stories about all the really bad decisions I've made over a specific period of time. And I'll probably be telling you more about myself. And by the end of this talk, you'll know much more about me than most people do. So I'll start with this. A couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with an illness known as narcolepsy. Uh, it's characterized by being drowsy, just randomly falling asleep, uh, sleep paralysis, and a whole lot of other things that sound scary, especially because around the same time I was also diagnosed with ADHD. What this actually means for me is that, especially when I'm not on any medication, when I'm attending conferences, classes, or really boring meetings, I end up in one of two states. So I'm either falling asleep or someone will say something that catches my attention and then my imagination just runs wild with me. So I saw on um, this conference's schedule that an amazing speaker, one of my favorite, will be speaking. Her name is Gergana Young. So I attended a talk where Jerry spoke about um, her experience of flying a drone with Node and she put this tweet up um, on the screen. It read, I flew my drone with Node, but also I crashed my drone into the wall with Node. This caught my attention and I got thinking, firstly, how on earth did Jerry crash or firstly fly her drone with Node? And then secondly, if Jerry could crash her drone using Node, I wonder how else I can cash, crash a drone. So today I bring you five ways to kill a perfectly good drone for absolutely no reason. I'll start with a short story. On my way home, one evening from a work function, um, I was a bit intoxicated. And I ended up on the site that sells really, really cheap things. Um, but the problem is that these things usually arrive about after three months. Um, and I accidentally bought a drone. I say accidentally because I didn't remember this. And three months later, when the drone arrived, first thing I thought was, <laughs> who on earth bought me a drone? <laughs> and then I remembered, went and checked my history and saw that I actually ordered and paid for this drone. The drone that I bought was super, super awesome. This drone came with an HD camera. It came with an, an, an RC controller, some backup batteries and some really, really cool stuff. And then I realized that I don't actually have a use for a drone. What am I going to use this for? And 
after speaking to a few friends, people suggested that I hack this drone. Sure, why not? And then that's how my mission started. I decided that I'm going to hack this drone and try and fly it in as many different ways as I can. Now, as all expert hackers will tell you, the first step to hacking is observation. You need to observe what this drone is doing. And once you understand what the, 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 the system is doing, you can then try to mimic it in order to control this drone. So to do this, I spoke to a few people who know a bit more about networking than I do, because I wanted to understand how the drone's controllers were actually controlling the drone. The drone has an, an Android app. Figured, well, that's code. I think I can write code, so I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to simulate what this uh, application is doing. I was pointed to an application called Wireshark, which lets you trace the network traffic on a specific port. So this is what a Wireshark trace looks like. It looks a bit scarier than it actually is. The colorful parts that you see, those are the actual individual logs. And once you click on one of them, the section at the bottom actually um, specifies or details what data was traced for that specific thing. The problem here was that I was sniffing the, the, the Wi-Fi network that was open on the drone. So when you turn on the drone, it exposes a Wi-Fi network and you can then use the app to connect to that Wi-Fi network and start, and start sending commands. So I was sniffing data on the drone itself, but what I needed to do was to see what my phone was sending so that I can write code that would send the exact same thing to the drone. For that, I found this app called T Packet Capture on the, on the Android Play Store. And I thought this was good because I didn't have to root my phone or do any of those weird things. I could just download the app and use it. And again, I felt that it was safe because it's on the Google Play Store, so I can go around doing it. Now, this didn't help me. I wasn't able to really see everything that was happening, but what I did see was that this app actually sends UDP packets to the drone. What on earth is a UDP packet? I didn't know. Then I realized that I'm now going down a bit of a rabbit hole. It was suggested that I use um, Apple devices because they're so in sync that you can use the, the MacBook to, to sort of trace what's happening on your phone. And I then convinced my friend Matthew, because at the time I didn't have any Apple devices, to let me use his phone and let me trace the network traffic and basically spy on his phone. So some really interesting things, but because I realized that I'm now going down a rabbit hole and because I was planning to talk about this in person, and so I sometimes care about your safety, I decided that I should probably look at a simpler solution, a simpler, cleaner and better solution to hacking this drone. And of course, that was to buy a better drone, a drone that's easier to work with. Did some research and I came across the Parrot Mambo Mini absolutely incredible drone. It's tiny, fits in the palm of my hand, and it comes with attachable accessories such as a cannon shooter or claws so that I can fly my drone to go pick up my bear. And this drone was really, really fun to play around with. So this drone uses two means of communication, BLE or Bluetooth Low Energy and Wi-Fi. Since I'd struggled so much and learned so much about Wi-Fi, I decided to focus on Bluetooth Low Energy because it's a chance to learn something new. So Bluetooth will sound familiar to some of you. For the slightly more mature audiences, you'll remember this. You had these things attached to your faces pretending to be in, in, in serious meetings just to avoid human interaction that you now probably crave so much. And for people more around my age without revealing too much, you remember that we had just come out of using infrared technology to send files between phones. So even though we, we were using Bluetooth, we were still putting our phones together. BLE is slightly different. It's often marketed as Bluetooth Smart and it's a form of wireless communication really, but it has three distinct things or three things that distinguish it from traditional Bluetooth. So the first is its power consumption. Organizations can run BLE devices for four years without needing to update, um, without needing to change the, the power supply or the batteries. This means that the applications that we, we, we use BLE for are slightly different as well. So BLE works perfectly when you need to send short sort of like bursts of data um, across, which, which means that you're not constantly sending information. Now, these applications then are, are then dictated by how this data is sent. And one of the really cool things is that this can take up to 20 simultaneous connections 
while traditional Bluetooth could, on, could only go up to seven. So we can now do some, we can now connect multiple devices simultaneously. So a bit more about me. I come from a game development background, I studied game design, which means that Unity has been my hammer. I hit absolutely everything with it. I've built some really scary things with Unity, things that I shouldn't be building with Unity, but nonetheless, it's my hammer that I hit everything with. And then I started working with another speaker today, Jerry Young and Mike Hazer, who are both avid, avid lovers of JavaScript. And I feel like through working with them, I've developed a new weapon, an X, if you will, called JavaScript. And I hit JavaScript with absolutely everything. Now this project was no different. I decided going to try this with Node first. Found two libraries named Noble and Blino. Developers think we're cool when we name things, but Noble and Blino are essentially almost opposites of each other. So you, you use Noble when you're building a central module, like if I'm building something that will connect to devices and use Blino when you're implementing peripherals, such as a heart rate monitor to speak to that central module. Since I wanted to build something that would run on my computer and talk to this peripheral called a drone, I had to use Noble. A bit more about me. Before becoming a developer, I was dead set on being a pilot. I spent some time in the South African Air Force. And for the first time, the knowledge that I gained there came to use. So I realized that to fly this drone or the drone terminologies um, are quite similar to those of planes. So you can roll um, your drone. So if you're thinking about a plane, this is when a pilot basically tilts a plane to the left and just hopes that the wind will carry the plane where it needs to go. A yaw is almost like doing donuts. So like spinning around this axis, yes. And then a pitch is when the pilot just faces up and hopes that the wind will take the plane where it's supposed to go. So at number five, the ways to kill a perfectly good drone is Node. Decided I'm going to fly this with Node.js. And the first thing I encountered was that in order to inform this drone what I wanted to do, I had to send this long XML structure for every single command. There's no way that I was going to generate or write up all of this XML for each and every single command. So decided, well, surely there's a solution for this. I mean, I am after all using JavaScript. I did what every web developer does, went and Googled, and I found a script called minidrone.js or minidrone.js. What this does is that it, it actually takes in two strings or three strings and then generates the XML for me, which is absolutely brilliant. This means that I can generate that entire XML with one line of code just by passing in three strings. What this in turn means is that I can connect to, start up and take off a drone in less than 10 lines of code. With code or an 10 lines, including some decorative lines, what that's like three lines of just empty space. So I can now fly this drone. I won't show you that today because I've, 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 I've had some bad experiences with this demo, but around the same time when I was doing this, Mike Hazer gave a talk titled, what should the web do? And I think this is an incredibly important discussion that web developers should be having because while we have this discussion, our users already know what they want the web to do. They want the web to do everything and they want it to do everything today. The good news is that browser manufacturers are also coming to the forefront, which means that things that the web um, and browsers were, were, were often critiqued for, browser manufacturers are now building into these browsers so that we can create much more meaningful um, user experiences. And so with this in mind, at number four, we have JavaScript straight from your browser, not using Node, just running it straight from your browser. Now, this once again had, had, had me thinking about how to connect to the drone. Jerry speaks a lot about Bluetooth and to quote it directly, I love Bluetooth because it's so imperfect. I agree. Now, Bluetooth Low Energy, straight from your browser, or known as Web Bluetooth, allows us to connect to Bluetooth devices straight from our browser. This means that we can activate the browser and make it a, a, a really central user interface to talk to all the things around us. We have a lot of smart devices around us, and we can start using Bluetooth technology straight from the user's browser. 
in doing this, I looked again for any open source projects that I could leverage off. And I found this project by Peter, o by Peter O'Shaughnessy, who had the script, specific script called Drone V1.2, where he effectively wrote the code to connect to the drone itself. I took the script, reworked it a bit, cleaned it up, turned it into classes, and did a few more things that would work better for me. And I created two scripts, Drone Connection Management and Drone Control. Now, with these two scripts imported into any HTML file or any JavaScript file, for that matter, it means that I can start writing code like this, where I can simply reference the drone as drone and then call simple commands like move left, move right, flip, forwards and backwards, just like that, which means that it doesn't matter where I'm getting the controls from, I've now got the core of how to actually control and fly this drone. And that brings me at number three, mimicking other devices. A bit more about me, I'm fascinated by human computer interaction. I really, really think that if we rethink and reimagine how we interact with computers, we can create much more interesting experiences. Most of them learning experiences, but interesting experiences nonetheless. Now, this is particularly interesting in the web because web, firstly, developers can't agree on what technology is best. There's wars, whether native is better, hybrid is better, web is better, even among web developers themselves. There are ancient wars about which framework is better, etc. But we have the W the W3C, which tries to make a lot of the core functionality that we need as a part of the browser. And this is in line with their mission to lead the web to its full potential by developing these web standards that browser manufacturers then build on. If you go to the MDN web docs, you can see very, very good documentation on the available web APIs, which ones are experimental, et cetera. And when I was on the site, one of them caught my attention. This was the then experimental uh, census API. Now this allows us to tap into a device's accelerometer, proximity center, ambient light sensor, and all these weird sensors that we are carrying around in our pockets, in our cell phones. And to check if the browser um, supports any of these features, these are the very three simple ways of checking. Check if it's a function, check if it's in window, um, and when you want to create this new sensor so that you can start referencing it, the code is pretty simple. Let sensor equals new accelerometer or const really. Mike would kill me if he saw me. Well, Mike suggests that I use let and const where I should be. Anyway, once you've created this, you need to start reading. Sensor.start, pretty simple way, but you can't read forever. Sensor.stop will stop the sensor from streaming in this information for you. And then you can simply add an event listener to actually do something with the sensor data. Now, armed with this knowledge, it meant that I could take my phone and pick up data as my phone is lifted towards my face, away from my face, to the left, to the right, and use that information to try and control the drone. Now, a key part of building better browsers is building good developer experience. And so the Chrome browser, for instance, um, allows you to actually inspect data that is, or inspect what's happening on your cell phone. Just put your cell phone in debugging mode, connect it via a USB cable, and you can actually inspect what's happening in your, in your actual browser from your computer. So this means that as I move the phone, you can actually see that um, our XYZ values are changing. Now this is accelerometer data, and this data is presented to me in XYZ. All I then did is I mapped what these values are when my phone is standing straight, what the values are when my phone is in these other different po positions and using that information, I can then now fly a drone. And this is what that looks like. So as I tilt my phone up, the drone takes off. I lean my phone forward, drone goes forward, backwards, and it does that. When I put my phone in its resting position, the drone lands. Case in point, Using JavaScript from your browser is almost a sure way of destroying your drone. At number two, I have flying your drone with hand gestures. Now, I need to start with a story here again. One afternoon, I'm at work, having a few drinks with colleagues, 
and I'm, I promise you, someone just came to me and gave me a box. Till today, I can't remember who this person was or what they said to me when they gave me this box. This is what that box was. It was called something, or it, 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 it's a box with something called the leap motion sensor. Now, what the leap motion sensor does is that it actually map, maps out the joints and bones in your hand, bones, I guess, in your hand in a 3D space. This means that if I could find a way to tap into this and read all of that data, I can effectively map my drone's movement to the movement of my hand. So I wrote some JavaScript code and I found this interesting because this also showcased just how we can start plugging in USB devices and access that data directly from our browser, which is something again that browsers were critiqued for in the past. What that looks like is this. So as the drone takes off, when I tilt my hand to the left, the drone follows my movement, tilt it to the right, forward, the drone moves forward, and that's effectively following the movement of my hand. Now, what's interesting is that now I can start doing some interesting movements like moving the drone horizontally or making the drone spin, do donuts with the drone effectively. And this is a bit tricky to control because I'm literally just watching my hand with this camera and then just mapping the movement of the drone. I'm not getting any uh, feedback directly to my hand, which is why I often struggle to actually fly it. Now, this is one of the drawbacks of having this conference virtually is that the drone gets out of frame. That's why I decided to pre-record all of these demos this morning, um, because if it's out of frame during this talk, that would just be awkward. So a bit more about myself. I was an only child until my brother decided to be born. He is quite young. He's 10 years old and he's very, very smart. He makes me uncomfortable because when I see all of the things that annoy me about him, they're actually things that I do. Nonetheless, I like him a lot and I'd like to teach him um, about technology. One of the things that I've realized is that one of the best ways to get people interested in technology is by firstly showing them how accessible and practical technology is, showing them the fact that technology has so much potential to change how we do absolutely everything, and in order to break this barrier or this idea that people have um, about technology being this difficult, this challenging, this impossible field is by using things that people have every single day in their lives and showing them how technology can bring those things alive. So at number one, I bring you flying a drone with bananas. How on earth? Our MC asked me to explain this further. So how about I show you first, and then we can talk about it. So over here, I've got two bananas, well, four. The reason I have four bananas is because I didn't have breakfast today. I was hungry, so I ate the fifth one. So just bear with me. And what I'm doing there is that I'm taking these bananas and connecting wires directly to them. These wires are connected to a very special um, board which I'll talk about in a second. But the last banana that I'm con connecting, you'll see I'm holding it up, is a very special banana. And what we're trying to do is when I tap one of these buttons or one of these bananas, they should act as buttons and control the drone and make the drone do all of these weird and wonderful things. So we've checked that the drone is um, set and on and is waiting for us to send commands to it. We take it off and you'll see that my left hand stays on the magic banana. Now, as I touch the different bananas, the drone goes in different ways. The drone just did a backflip there. I know that it's out of frame, so you'll just have to trust me. But when I touch the one banana, moves left, moves right, the middle one, the drone does a backflip. Now, every time I tell people, just trust me, when it comes to talks and technology, people don't believe it because people want to see demos. So I reshot a demo specifically for the flip. So you can see, once again, I'm holding the special banana. And when I touch the middle one, the drone does a flip. Touch the left, the drone moves to the left. Touch the right, the drone moves to the right. It nearly crashed there. Last flip, just for good luck. And now I can safely land our drone on my palm. 
that's one of my favorite things about this drone that it, it is so small that I can fit it almost perfectly in the palm of my hand. Now, how did I do all of this? You'll see that all of the bananas there are connected to one common chip effectively or one board. The board that you're seeing there is called a Makey Makey. It is incredible, one of my favorite boards. I first came across this board when I was a student and we had a games festival, a digital arts festival called Amaze. And we had makers from all over the world come and showcase things that they were working on. And that's when I came across this board. Now I played Space Invaders using this board and this board was connected to fruits. And that's what really has inspired me till this day. How this board works is that it's got a few pins that you can connect wires to. These wires are then mapped to different keyboards, uh, to, to, to different keyboard uh, keys or buttons. And as you press them, they fire off these um, keyboard events. So what I've done is that I've taken um, these bananas and I've connected them to all the different keyboard things. And the code that I write simply, li simply listens for keystrokes. So if you opt for keyboard events. So if you press A, move the drone left. If I press D, move the drone right. And if it's S, flip the drone. Now, how this works is, 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 is that this works because we as humans can actually conduct electricity because we're made up of some water, um, but all organic matter can actually conduct some electricity. And based on that, when I'm holding this magic fruit, I'm actually holding the ground pin and all the other pins are set at a high. So when I touch one of these bananas, I'm actually touching the pins because the bananas um, conduct electricity. And I'm now trying to pull that pin's voltage all the way to zero. The code that I write simply listens for that voltage drop. It won't drop all the way to zero because we're pretty bad conductors, but there will be a drop that's significant, significant enough to pick up using code. Now, this board, buying it locally costs almost a thousand rands and not everyone is able to spare that to start playing around with the stuff. So I've built the equivalent using the cheapest Arduino that I could find called the Arduino Uno. And again, connected to the different pins, I use a digital to analog converter so that I can analog values are or other way around rather analog to digital converter so that I can change those volt drops to actual um, digital values that I can pick up using code. Write some basic C code um, to, to, to then read those values using the Arduinos, using the Arduino, and I can then infer that this button or this banana has been touched or this banana has been grounded. And then I also wrote something to, to sort of communicate that or broadcast that using serial communication. And using something like Unity 3D, you can actually pick up on those messages when the Arduino board sends them out to say this pin has, has, has been grounded or this pin has been grounded. Now, if you are interested in building your own custom controller, I've written quite a detailed um, article um, showing you exactly how to go about it. It's currently on dev.to, so feel free to go and check that out. It uses, again, as I said, probably the cheapest Arduino that we can find. So I've shown you some ridiculous things today. I flew a drone with bananas, um, got hungry and ate one of them. I've flown a, 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 a drone with my hands. And the last time I did this, it crashed into my face. I've flown this drone with all sorts of crazy things. And the question I often get is why? Well, it's pretty simple. To be a developer, especially where the tech is constantly growing, we have to constantly grow ourselves. We have to constantly learn, we have to constantly improve, which means that we, we have to learn new technologies. The one way that I do that is by building ridiculous things. By building ridiculous things, I have fun learning all of these new technologies. In addition to that, it's a fun way of getting people who are not really into technology or who don't think that they're into technology, getting them interested and showing them the power that simple, simple technology has. And if you take away one thing from this talk is that it is absolutely important for you to keep playing. Don't stop playing because as you play, that's how you grow. And as you grow, that's how you learn. Thank you very much.